89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. Up next, Terra Verde. Hello and welcome to today's edition of Terra Verde, a weekly environment program on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host for this afternoon, Maureen Nandini Mitra. You know, as an environmental journalist, I spend a lot of time reporting, writing and thinking about the many challenges facing our living world. I talk with scientists and economists and politicians and activists and regular folks. I try to take sometimes hard-to-grasp ideas like quantifying emissions and carbon offsets and fair shares and climate equity, etc. And I find that it's really, really hard to talk about these things in a way that moves people to action. After years of work in this field, I've realized that facts and numbers and science alone can't bring about change. I think that's because these facts and numbers appeal only to the hemisphere of our brain that values logic and reason, while we humans are perhaps more creatures of emotion and intuition rather than of logic. Maybe that is why, uh, you know, numbers don't quite communicate to most people what is really a very simple and very urgent message that we must get across, that we all live on one planet and that planet is coming apart. But I find there's one group of people who can deliver this message in a way that strikes people's hearts. And that group is poets, writers and artists. And that's what I want to talk about on today's show with my guests, about the power of art, of ideas and words to change minds. To explore this idea, I have with me in studio two award-winning Bay Area eco-poets and authors who also happen to be scientists. I have Maya Kosla, who is the Poet Laureate of Sonoma County. Maya is also a field-based biologist and a writer and filmmaker, and she has just come out with a new book of poems, All the Fires of Wind and Light, published by Sixteen Rivers Press which invites readers to find themselves in the wild, even in the most challenging times. And I have Lucille Day Lang, well-known poet and author and founder of a small press, Scarlet, Scarlet Tanager Books, that showcases poetry, fiction, literary history, and literary criticism by West Coast writers. Lucy, like Maya, has worn many hats. Among other things, she's been a science writer and administrator at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, a staff scientist at the Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute, and a school district math science specialist. Her publishing house has just come out with a new anthology of poems that uh, she has co-edited, Fire and Rain, Eco-Poetry of California. Lucy, Maya, welcome to Terra Verde. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maya, perhaps we could kick off with uh, with a poem from your new book, and maybe you could read one and give our listeners some context, uh, either before or after the reading of the poem. Sure, thanks. Um, I want to read Diablo Winds because it speaks to the 2017 Sonoma fires that uh, from which I had to evacuate in October 2017. And, uh, of course, after that, being fire safe on the home front has been one of my main concerns. And, unfortunately, these days, a lot of the actions are taken to supposedly protect homes, but there are actions taken in faraway forests, so-called, so-called fuels reductions that are large-scale logging operations that can actually make matters worse in terms of high-severity fire. So we, you can see that from aerial photos. But this poem, it begins and ends kind of at and ho- close to the home front in a hope of unlogged forests uh, existing and they grow back so quickly. So that's called Diablo Winds. We woke to shrill voices and smoke, winds letting go, messages flying far, a pine and cedar incense of imminence wrapping the stars. Santa Anna, Diablo, Fawn, pages flapping, nothing to hold the books, the photos, the shared cups of tea to the moment, rooms loosened from meaning, walls turning into paper in the hands of chance, anything, anything, grabbed without thought, the mind a leaf spinning, 
the prayers caught in our throats for months. One for shelter. One for first responders knocking on doors. One for the lost. One for fighters driving through flames. One for hills rimmed with a rolling brightness. For history to make us wise about lands that have always returned after fire. For time, for time, for the surprises tiptoeing in unannounced just weeks after the flames. One for rain and the rise of suncup, biscuit root, toad flax and whispering bells. For the plentiful, flaring open, petal upon ash, songbirds upon branches of charcoal, black bear upon berries of abundance, fresh juices trickling down the corners of her mouth. Wow, oh, that's beautiful. This, 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 this is just so much packed into those lines because it talks both about destruction but also about renewal, re- renewal of life and, you know, touches upon how wildfires have so long been a part of the California landscape. Um, yeah. uh, Lucille, I did want to uh, turn to actually both of you um, in terms of, um, you know, I've been thinking about the history of the environmental movement in the West and how, you know, specifically when it comes to social movements, the environmental movement has been influenced so heavily by writing and by poetry, um, you know, and um, I wanted to know if, you know, what your thoughts were in on, in that and maybe Lucille, you could take that first? Um, yes, uh, definitely. We have um, poets who, a lot of major environmental poets in California, um, and some of them right here in Berkeley, uh, Robert Haas and Brenda Hillman, some at Gary Snyder in the Sierra. And Robert Haas founded um, a, a poetry festival called the Watershed um, Environmental Poetry Festival. Um, that many people attend, and they hear poetry, and um, they also learn about environmental issues. And he also founded another organization called River of Words, and that is a an or it's based now at St. Mary's College, and that uh, has children writing environmental poetry. And at the same time, of course, they're learning about the scientific issues. Right. I think it's just that there's something about nature. That speaks to everyone, which is why more than any other movement, I think, you know, people always look up or look down or look at the horizon. And that's what sort of is kind of a common ground, which everyone can relate to. I feel that's why environmental movements and poetry and art have been so connected. Would you? Yeah. I I recently came back from uh, taking kids from Roseland, elementary school, um, James Monroe, actually, to Pepperwood Preserve, where some of the burned forests, the oaks have recovered beautifully. And we stood under what we call Grandma Oak, Mm -hmm. which is a huge sprawling oak. And it's very clear it was burned. And they were just fascinated that this huge burnt trunk and all this this abundance of green leaves and later saw an oak with a bench-like branch where they could all sit. And they said, well, this is Grandma Oak's daughter. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's... um, they have a fresh look at things and it's just they don't think metaphor or simile they just come up with things it's so it's it's instant um and wild, wildness kind of appeals mm-hmm. to people of all ages i think right lucy i wanted to turn to you to if you could read a poem from the new anthology and then maybe talk a bit about maybe both of you can talk a bit about how science informs both your writings um, okay. Well, I uh, want to read a, a poem about drought because that re- relates to um, all of the big fires we've been having um, that um, Maya just read her beautiful poem about. Um, everything is drier uh, due, due to drought and more susceptible to fire. We've just had a, a seven-year drought in California. And but now this past season we've had more rain than usual, which has um, included flooding and mudslides. And both the drought um, and the excessive rain are symptoms of climate change because climate change, brought on by human activities, causes extreme weather. So um, I'm going to read a poem called "Drought Fall" from the anthology. It's by T. M. Lawson. 
a Southern California poet. And it starts out with a, an epigraph. This is the epigraph. A hike through the Santa Monica Mountains to a well-known watering hole. Drought fall. A journey through thistles, through brambles to come to a wall of stone. Where had the water gone? I touched the trickle left behind, the dried moss on rock, and the stagnant water pooled below like blood. Where had the water gone? I looked at the abandoned swing over the shrunken pool, wood wilting on the rope. Where had the water gone? I knelt down in the dry riverbed, crushing the silken dirt. Where had the water gone? The other visitors gazed on the waterfall's dust. Santa Monica, forgive us. Where did the fall go? Did the water run? Well, as you said, we're, for the first time in many years, not in drought in any part of California, and that's maybe something to be thankful for, but we're also bearing the brunt of what has happened before in terms of, you know, the mudslides, which have taken a few lives already, right? Right, yeah, yeah. and we can be thankful for having more water this uh, this year, but with global warming, um, we're going to have more droughts, unfortunately, and we have to not only be ready for them and be... Um, conservative with our use of, of water and, and how it, it's distributed throughout the state, but we really should be taking steps um, like, like causing fewer carbon emissions so that um, we could try to turn um, global warming around. And it's, you know, every every individual is responsible, really. Right. Which brings me back to, um, you know, my earlier question about could could you talk about how your scientific background, your background in science, informs what you write about and how you write about it? Maya, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, I've been so curious about going out and actually initially was quite nervous about going out into burned forests. This is the latest last five years of work that I've been doing. And um, I was a little nervous for three weeks and that was it because it. I quickly realized how beautifully they grow back when they're left unlogged, undisturbed and how everything that belongs there and belonged there before comes right back and uh, about 90 species of birds, which is seems staggering and unbelievable, nesting in there, depending on this habitat and all the mammals, um, amphibians, reptiles, you name it. So it's... I'm just um, enthralled by it. It just tends to just wash into all the writing because it's just, uh, uh, it's kind of taken over my imagination, I guess. I don't know. Um, yes, and having been trained as a biologist, um, I'm very interested in ecosystems. I'm interested in how the ecosystems work, and that um, spurred my whole interest in eco-poetry. Um, when I got the idea for the, my anthology, Fire and Rain, Eco-Poetry of California, um, eight years ago now, in, in 2011, when I read a couple of other um, eco-poetry anthologies, and when I read those anthologies, I thought, something is missing here. Um, we need a book just about California. California is such a big, beautiful, diverse state with so many um, ecosystems, and and then I immediately had the idea of organizing it by bioregion. So the anthology has sections of, of eight major sections of poetry. It starts with coast and ocean and then coastal redwoods. And each section is focused on one type of ecosystem. And you get poems about the various habitats and organisms in, in, in each of those bioregions. And so you see... Um, how uh, how everything is is connected, and I think people can learn a lot of biology from my poetry anthology as well as just enjoying the poetry. Great. Yeah. This is Maureen, and you're tuned into Terra Verde, a weekly environment radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Today we are talking about eco poetry and its role in the environmental movement and the power of art to change minds and hearts with two powerful Bay Area eco-poets and scientists, 
Lucille Lang Day and Maya Kosler. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit more about on eco poetry and what poets are writing about today. I feel like there's been like a change, you know, in in the subject matter in some sense. In that, you know, what we write, what what we see written more about, uh, seem to be, you know, the impact that we are having on the environment. And this, do you feel like there's been a shift? Uh, yes, and to me, the term eco poetry means poetry about ecosystems. So it can be something celebrating or honoring ecosystems, but it also it can be poems that point out the problems in ecosystems, that point out loss of species, pollution, climate change, all of these things that um, have adverse in- impacts on all of the Earth's ecosystems. So there's been a shift. I think where poets are writing now less about the celebratory aspects of nature and more of the and more about these major issues that we face but I think both are necessary and I think that we still have there's still a lot of beauty there's a um a lot of reason to be awed by nature and there's a lot that remains to be preserved. So we need both kinds of poems. Right. So maybe we can have another reading. Maya, I was thinking perhaps deforestation, since we are talking about the more grimmer trend of in the writing. Sure, yeah. So the uh, I'll only read a little bit of it, um, the first part of it. Um, it does seem like we're losing a lot to log. I mean, you, you, can, you can fly over it, but also the more tricky stuff that you can fly over and not detect is called thinning, mm-hmm. which can actually make fires much worse and uh, has. You can see that it's really visual when a fire goes through an area that's been where the big stuff has been pulled out and it just kind of burns really hot. Um, and unfortunately, we in California, we think we're really far ahead, but in we're actually... Um, in the process right now, people should watch out for something called SB 632, which is basically a prologging bill that um, goes through and um, invalidates most of the CEQA process. That's going to come up in April. So, But anyway, uh, there's plenty to see out there. And I've this is part of been my experience over and over, these beautiful areas that are intact, that kind of like islands, and then these areas that have been slashed. Deforestation. By evening, the mountains are women wrapped in dark shawls. They sit hunched over embers. The quiet exchange spans the ages, the present. The living, no less or nothing. We are restless as wind, streaking the sky with cirrus and smoke. We are no more than a moment of Phoebes and bluebirds, rising and falling to their thin, plaintive ribbons of sound. Nice. Um, and Lucy, I think we talked about uh, you reading Logging Old Growth, maybe? Uh, yes, bec- because logging in California and logging worldwide is not a new problem. It's not just related to um, th- uh, thinning the forests for fire prevention, which is a very questionable practice and probably make, does more harm than good, but also, uh, there's been a lot of uh, capitalism-driven uh, logging, including logging uh, 95% of the old-growth redwoods in California. Um, and I'm going to read just an excerpt from a poem called Logging Old Growth, 1964. And it, it's, it's early in the poem, the, the poet, whose name is Robert Coates, um, compares the trench that where uh, the redwood is going to fall to a grave dug to receive the body of the redwood giant. And then this is the end of the poem. They begin again, a rhythmic clink, clink of steel on steel as they drive home the wedges with sledgehammer blows. Another pause, the final shouted warning, three more swings, a sharp crack, and the whole tree shudders, its topmost twigs now arcing downward. Then, for the last time, wind rushes through the scaly foliage, debris falling, sapling snapping, chaos of lichen flying, a seismic boom, so loud 
it will echo down the years. And the problem here is, you know, capitalism out of control and not having the Earth's resources used sustainably, but for short-term profit. So um, part of um, addressing um, climate change is and uh, uh, fire mitigation, all of it, capitalism is part of it, That and there needs to be breaks on it. Right. Um, we talked a lot about wildfires and trees, but you know the Calif- our state is defined as much by by its ocean, by its coastlines, as it is by its redwoods and sequoias. And um, I did want to move on to talking about the ocean a little bit, um, which is also severely under peril. Um, um, my actually, I wanted to move on to you here. But, you know, you mentioned earlier when we talked about this message you received from India about sea turtles, uh, which to me is such a telling example of how all our lands and waters are linked and how what we do here in California has an impact, you know, halfway across the world. Um, so I was wondering if you could read um, something from your poem, Sea Turtles. Yeah, sure. About three days ago, I got this note from... Um, a young man in uh, the east coast of India, Odisha. And he basically said, Respect, madam, mass nesting don't became this year. Um, which is means the Aribada, the mass nesting of sea turtles along the east coast of India, has ceased as of this year. And I don't know if it'll be back next year or not, but things are moving very fast. Sea turtles arrive. Desire and good timing are tangled forever in darkness. All who emerge are offspring of an edge whose salts and sighs echo those of the waves. We who have traveled hundreds of miles stand back, the night rising and sinking under phosphorescence, churned up by the crash and back sizzle of sand. Terrified, that life, laden with plum-sized pearls of the future, could lose her lumbering grip on this world. And that's just a section of it, basically. Thank you. Um, Yeah, I was really moved by that because um, I've been following the journey of these baby turtles for years, and it's sad to know that it's not, it didn't happen for the first time this year. Um, I did want to talk to both of you, um, have you sort of weigh in on this um, thought that I had about, you know, um, the idea that still has some traction that, you know, white people have the option of aesthetic concerns while people of color operate within much narrower concerns of survival. I mean, in other words, that white people care about wilderness, about outdoor recreation, open spaces, wildlife, ecosystems, and writings that inform these things while people of color, you know, care more narrowly about the air, water, soil, soil quality, etc. of their environment. And, you know, that people of color don't really write or are interested in eco-poetry so much, which you both, Maya, you're clearly a, a, of South Asian descent and... Um, Lucy, you have some Native American heritage, right? Yes. So I wanted, maybe you could address that. Okay. And then quickly maybe read one poem that ends on a happy note. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think that, that, that poets of color um, definitely are interested in the aesthetic aspects as well as the environmental damage aspects as, as poets. Um, there are, there's a number of... Um, Poets of color in my anthology, Fire and Rain, including Rafael Jesus Gonzalez, who's the Poet Laureate of Berkeley currently. Uh, There's a Southern California poet named Liz Gonzalez. Um, There are many uh, poets. There's a Native American poet, Kurt Schweigman, who co-edited an anthology with me called Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California. Um, there are several Native American poets in the in the book, and there are African American poets too. And I would say they are equally concerned with um, the the beauty of nature and with the um, environmental damage. Thank you. Um, would you yeah. Would you like to? We don't have much time, oh. so I would. <laughs> okay, we don't but have much time. Ma- okay. Maya, did you want to add something to that? 
Oh, yeah, I've, I actually started with air, water and soil as a toxicologist and kind of branched out um, pretty quickly from there because of concerns about the wild and, and actually was thrown into the field for, for those types of studies. Okay, so should I read a, a positive poem? Yes, I think because, you know, we, we deal with, in, an, in the environmental field, we deal with so much sad news, it would be nice to end with something that was more celebratory. Okay, mm-hmm. so, so this poem is a joyful poem that came out of a, a night walk at Muir Woods. It's called Muir Woods at Night. Rust-colored ladybugs, clustered like grapes, mate on horse tails that wave by a creek, where silvery salmon spawn and leap when the sandbar breaks at the gate to the sea. The ladybugs have come hundreds of miles from valley to coast for this single's bash. The females are choosy. They twiddle the males, seeking appendages padded with fat. And all around, high in redwood burls, on elk clover leaves, and in the rich soil, the meaning of life is to stroke and prod under a humpbacked moon dissolving in fog. And when I read that, sometimes people ask me, how'd you ever get to go to Muir Woods at night? (laughs) And I went um, on a night hike with a a naturalist named Michael Ellis. So you can look up Michael Ellis online. He does outings called Footloose Forays. You know, maybe he'll do another night walk sometime in, in Muir Woods. Awesome. Thank you for reading that. Well, that's all we have time for on today's show. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Lucy, for joining us today for this interesting conversation about eco-poetry and environmentalism. This world certainly needs more poetry and music, Mm -hmm. so let us uh, encourage more writing in um, honor of saving the world. To buy both these wonderful books of poetry, go to Small Press Distribution at spdbooks.org for more information about Fire and Rain, including the list of environmental organizations that will receive profits from the book. Go to Scarlett, Scarlett Tanager Books at scarletttanager.com. Thanks to engineer Mike Cohen, this show and others will be available at kpfa.org at your convenience. Have a great weekend, everyone. is a 2002 New Zealand family drama directed by Nikki Caro. Traditionally, the leader in this Maori tribe should be the firstborn grandson, a direct patrilineal descendant of their ancestor Paikia, the well rider who rode on top of a whale from Hawaii. But to break with convention, a female child in the bloodline will have to do the impossible and prove her worthiness. But we can learn, and if the knowledge is given to everyone, then we can have lots of leaders. And soon everyone will be strong, not just the ones that have been chosen. So join us for our next monthly movie matinee as we screen Well Rider with a post-movie discussion led by members of KPFA's Apex Express. That's Saturday, April 27th, 3 p.m. at the New Parkway Theatre in Oakland. For more information, visit kpfa.org. 
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248PR in Santa Cruz, as well as online at kpfa.org.